The first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. How's it going, everybody? I'm Philip Ong. I'm here with Ding DuPont over there. And we're here to bring you guys another update on Kilauea Volcano's 2020-2021 eruption. So let's uh, get it going here for you guys. I'm going to start you guys off today with a playback of the USGS Hawaii Vol Volcano Observatory videos, starting with this one right here. So what we've done is uh, all these videos are available on the USGS Facebook, Twitter, 
um, YouTube feeds. So I've taken them and just sped them up for you guys a little bit so that we can actually um, not spend quite as much time on every video looking at that. So here you can see the Western Vent. This video goes back to uh, December. So actually I was talking through the beginning here. I'll put it back. All right, here's our Western Vent. And this is back in December 25th. There's not any open active entry right over there. Just a whole bunch of gas venting out. We have a more open northern vent right over there. And that's what we kind of see mostly bubbling up and filling the crater. We had a little bit of a black ledge on that southwest side as it flowed over at that point, but really not much. It was kind of just beginning. That was the day that the vent switched over from that northern vent to the western vent. So and here we have a, a zoomed in view. This is from um, just a couple of days ago. So we see some spatter coming out the top of the western vent over here. And there's lava going through underground through here and coming out this upper breakout in the tube. There's a breakout down here as well. And then we also have this dancing dome fountain on here. I, I've sped it up three times just to remind you guys from the USGS video so we can kind of see it a little, a little bit more dynamic here and analyze a little bit what's going on. So still a lot of gas coming out of out the top up here and really four entry points right now, four points of eruption. This kind of spatter coming out there, stromboli in the middle effusive point there. And down over here, and you kind of see that kind of this kind of pulse at the beginning there with a little bit of extra spillover. So when lava can't get get in down to this dome over here, it's spilling out over this essentially overflow valve right above it up there. And that's something that seems to have happened in the last day. The reports are from USGS that uh, the dome fountain has died down, and that there's been more breakout from that same area in the tube as the video we just saw. So. Here sped up once again three times. Um, this is our, our entry point at the bottom of that western vent, and you can see the dome fountain bubbling right there. You can kind of see the crust is slowly spreading away outwards, but not nearly as fast as this thing is is churning right in the center. Right, that's an interesting thing. It's kind of a break in the crust right in there. Now we're zoomed into the top of that western vent, and one thing you can kind of look for is that lava is is collecting against the bottom, the inside of throat of this thing. So it's trying to get out, get out, get out, but it kind of collects against the bottom of that, that chimney, right? And it's going to fall in here. All right, you guys saw that chunk fall in there, and then I'm going to start spattering some more again. And that's kind of something that happens all throughout the whole eruption, right? So not only on this kind of chimney area, but you can imagine down that vent further down. So maybe the reason that dome fountain is not bubbling quite as high is because something is is clogging it a little bit and it's, you know, diverting the flow or something changed the direction slightly so the angle is slightly different. So um, that's kind of where that can come from. But we'll look at that in a little more detail. We're going to finish off the videos here. This is the regular USGS three times sped up helicopter overflight from yesterday. You can see our larger big island over here, our western vent. Our northern vent's still a little bit visible over here and that's partly because the lava has built up that perched elevated plateau and it's spilling down in the trenches and now that that vent is in a trench so it's not not filling quite as fast as the stuff in the middle so we can still see it right over here that northern vent not quite drowned and all the gas coming from that western vent right over there so a nice view of Mauna Loa volcano that big volcano off in the background the big sister Kilauea and some of those other smaller islands visible poking up through that kind of silvery crust that you see in the daytime doesn't really look that red yeah when it's, ex when it's exposed to the atmosphere it's releasing all of its heat all of its steam and that's what's allowing it to form that crust on the surface that's then getting pushed around and some areas moves more than others you know right right where the dome is happening it's bubbling up and down quite a lot and then it moves slowly away from there, and at the far end of the lake, it seems like it's mostly stagnant, and it kind of overturns, or lava flows come across the top of it. It's not quite clear from the thermal images, but that's, that's what I'll show you guys next. Is we'll have a, a, a time lapse here of um, our thermal images, and so this is kind of just recent. The recent last couple of days, the island seems like it's not moving a whole lot, but then it starts moving back in the last last few hours here. So I'll rewind it here manually for you guys. So you can kind of see, and maybe what I'll do is I'll put this all the way back to the beginning and let us watch it all the way through. So our water lake steaming away there in the beginning. There's a beginning of our island right there. Oh, changed. Let's back over here. You can see the island is getting parts of it inundated. There's one little chunk of island coming up over here. The smaller ones are not quite visible, but they're going to pop up. If you guys watch, they'll pop up right in there.
thank you guys for joining us today. And uh, please put your questions in the chat, and Dan will, will take them as he produces the, the show here and pass them along uh, at some point in the middle of our broadcast today to take some questions from you guys. So you guys can see here is that early on, that northern vent, and the island was drawn toward it. Big island and a smaller island next to it. And here's where those other, other few ones are popping up right in there. So they become visible once that western vent takes over. And now it's flooding over and flooding the whole area around. The northern vent's still visible here. There hasn't been quite any draining, but you can kind of see that at some point the circulation starts flowing back around. And it seems like at some point, although it's hard to tell from this, this speed animation exactly which way. But there seems to be some back and forth. It will be interesting to see from the USGS when they release some of the motion vectors for that transition time at some point in the future. So, but as it is now, that big island is still coming back. So here it is, kind of getting pulled back towards that western vent. And this is kind of when it's still oriented a long way towards it. And it's going to do a, a counterclockwise spin right here. And so it spins around. It hasn't quite got all the way there. And meanwhile, these other islands at the top have dispersed. And kind of spread out. So here now it's basically oriented. We're almost at a right angle to where it was before. So it was kind of drifting, see slowly drifting this way right here. And then it actually goes back a little bit. And what, what was reported is that at some point uh, in the last couple of days, uh, in the evening, it seemed like the island had become stuck, like it had actually got caught on the bottom of something or somehow, you know, we know that there's a, a, that submerged bench of land, that old piece of the 2000. Uh, 18 Halemamo crater floor, right? Um, that was down there that got covered by lava. And so it's interesting to think about maybe in this period right in here, there's this thing that was moving suddenly stop and then suddenly start going again here at the end. Like right there, right there looks like this actually could be stuck. It's not moving hardly at all. Everything's moving right around it. Right. So that's the stop. And then it seems to be going there at the very end. I kind of, kind of skip for you guys. Let me see if I can it back any better here. So yeah, it starts to move here again at the very end a little bit. But that's what's ha happening with our thermal images. And we'll show you guys next some of the imagery. So here is an image uh, taken from that same helicopter overflight. Uh, I believe it was yesterday uh, for USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. So you can see once again a nice lava shield volcano of Mauna Loa here in the background, right? Unlike our pointy top strato volcanoes. Our Hawaiian volcanoes have more fluid lava, so they make these long, broad lava flows that's so more fluid and the gases can bubble out of more easily. That's why this volcano is not blowing up. That's why the gas is bubbling away out of the lava. The lava isn't able to hold it in, it just the gas just flies out of there and the lava comes up kind of brought up by the gas. It's really about getting the gas out of there. And so in other volcanoes, places like St. Helens or you know um, strato volcanoes, Fuji, the, the magma might be too too sticky to allow the gases to escape. And so the bubbles can form bigger and build bigger pressure within the magma chamber. And that's what causes the bigger blast usually. So in Kilauea, we've always thought that the blasts were a result of a combination of fast magma rising up into a big amount of water. Not just what you might see exposed in a pond, but my, what's soaking through the ground everywhere. And that might be why you might have big explosions like in 1790 when we know that there was fresh lava thrown out of the crater during that eruption, right, and then a huge crater afterwards. And so we'll look at some of the history a little bit later um, on that. Um, so, but kind of, you can just zooming in here, you can see we have a little bit of red visible down here at the bottom. You know, it's uh, hard to see the red in the daytime, only where it's actively breaking apart the crust and moving the fastest where you see it red. You see our west vent over here and a little bit more wrinkled lava surface where it's moving a little bit faster there and there, but much more platy in this back section over here of the lava pond. So it's interesting to see how this thing, if it actually starts closing off, you can see a little bit of that, of the edge of that upper level right here. Right, so it could be that this thing starts closing in more and more and more. It become a smaller shape. It might be something that happens, you know, even as, the, as, it, as it peters out or as the rush rate goes down. We'll have to see what actually happens with that. All right, so getting right to it as far as what's, what's the pressure doing on a volcano, this is kind of what we're all interested in hearing, what's changing as far as the pressure. And it's really not a whole lot. It's the same downward trend we've had in the last, few, last week or so. Right, in the last two days, it's continued going down with a slight slowdown and slight rise and then going back down over here. But 
the bigger event, if we're look, looking back kind of since our last update a couple of days ago on a six still, um, there was a slight increase in the big, the big relative to the amount of, of deflation we've had in the last week, which is from two micro radians down to somewhere around half micro radians. So about one and a half we've dropped in the last week. And so compared to that, during that several hour period, we dropped down from about one half to two, two and a half, right? So more than that. So, and this looked like it might've been something that, that resembled a deflation inflation pattern that you see on other, other times on Kilauea Summit because of the nature of how it dropped quickly and then bottomed out and started coming back up, but it didn't complete that DI cycle as maybe they, they thought that it would. Instead, it seems to have continued depressurizing going downward. So that's interesting that it did that. That's the you know, more, most uh, enigmatic and interesting part. But the, the general pattern is still one of, of going down the pressure, the ground level tilting inwards because the pressure is dropping as the lava is able to, and the gas is able to escape and depressurize the magma chamber below. So it's, it's, I think it's always good to step back and look in relation. Here is about 25 micro radians uh, uh, on our graph, dropping down to a minus 20. 45 micro radians is what we dropped during that initial five days or so. Then we came back up a few micro radians. And then since then, what we've come back down, we're now below touching this minus 20 micro radian line over here on the right. I'm going to zoom in so you guys can maybe see it better. And we're kind of touching the line right down here, which is lower than we were even that number here so we're actually have now surpassed the, the low tilt of the eruption so far and we're, we're kind of adding to that now right and the green line is pool oil, and we, we don't see a signal from it right here so the pattern is still the same elsewhere in a volcano there's nothing to worry about anywhere else on a, on the, on the rift zones or anything like that it seems like after zooming in on this one it's kind of hard to see what's going on too much there but we had an initial coming down a bouncing back up a stabilization and maybe now it seems to be trending downward slightly something like that but we'll have to wait for more data that's kind of the big picture zoomed out kind of thing here so all right the lava level something that we're also interested in here and we'll give you the the more detailed DOSHS report shortly but for now you can see that the trend is still an upward trend slow upward trend of lava filling the crater um, compared to the earlier trend where over here it was it was gaining quite a lot right every one of these tick marks is 20 meters so gaining quite a lot in that initial part of the eruption and then since then dropped down a little bit and then a long slow rise since then so it keeps filling it's still slowly filling and we'll look at that shortly here so the most recent animation here the last 24 hours automatic from usgs on their webcams page right if you guys click on each individual webcam it'll give you uh, a 24-hour automatic time lapse generated by the, by the by the computer software. So we can kind of see it on a much shorter time scale than I showed you guys before. This thing is just doing a little bit of a wiggle back this way now, right? And you kind of see on this one it's a little bit easier to see a boundary somewhere in here where everything on this side is not moving quite as much, or where it does, it's kind of one flow coming over it, one at a time, one there, there, or there, right? One flow at a time there. My range of there, whereas the stuff in here is moving more, more quickly, and it's interesting that the island is almost like in the, in, the, in its wake is where this is forming. All the small islands seem like they're fixed in place now, in that crust, perhaps. Right, they don't seem to be moving much at all anymore, that I can tell at least on this scale. Compared to this one, is moving quite a bit faster. So interesting, interesting to look at the dynamic and how that thing is is turning and filling right and one thing that's interesting about how it's filling is you can see quite clearly on the, on the thermal image now that there's a clear boundary going around the outside of this thing right? and so only once in a while are we seeing the lava spilling over it's not like some of the more recent updates we've given you guys where this thing was sloshing over all almost all the time right here's our western vent pouring it at the bottom over here so it's not really sloshing over at all over there and instead it seems to be stagnating a little bit on this back end and it's rising taller but only as it as this margin at the top kind of closes in as well at the same time so we can still see the outline of our northern vent there's this little 
moon over here. Let me zoom in for you guys. You can see that little moon over there. That's our western, our northern vent, right there. And we'll move on and kind of make our way through the monitoring signals first. I wanted to point out that the USGS now has been plotting their gas data on their website. It's not um, quite as up to date as the text updates, but you can kind of see the, the pattern over there. So this is in the past month monitoring for Kilauea. And if you come down here past the information data, there's a gas data. I'm kind of zooming in here to this plot. You guys can see that they've put in data up until January the 3rd, which is over here, January the 3rd, and from about, about the 26th, perhaps, right up to the 25th as well. And so on a left plot axis here, this is 2,000 tons per day between the marks. So 2,000 at the bottom, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. This value up here is somewhere in the order of 19,000 average. All right, so what they're showing is that similar kind of pattern. Presumably, the eruption began on the 20th, so it came up to some level and then back down, and it's kind of been, this is a question mark right here. There's, there's a variation up and down all through here, and no clear trend upwards or downwards in either direction. And that's what we're kind of looking to see if we see some kind of downward trend, and we are not seeing that yet, reportedly. So until then, we have to believe eruption is going to continue, um, but we're still in a range of, you know, up to about a month eruption was the, the longest eruption that occurred in the refilling of Hale Magmao in 1924 post the collapse. That's been my working model so far. And until we pass that chapter of going longer than that, that's kind of what we'll keep working with. So there are still air impacts. Let's see if this purple air will load. No, it doesn't like to load right off the bat. But you can see that the, there are still health impacts. It's a little bit greener, still a few little yellows in the corner area today, west side of the island, but definitely some impacts there. And consequently, it has been because of some shifts in the winds. You can see earlier today at the Kilauea Visitor Center in a national park, there was some elevated particulate matter. It went into the orange for a few hours here, but it's been green. You know, I did an hour up at the park earlier today. Um, so you can check out, look for, for, look for that content a little later. And um, you can see that it was nice when we were up there. All right, steam vents kind of had a similar elevated spike in particular and SO2 as well, kind of coming in right around at the same time. So most likely a sh shift in the winds early in the morning. Everything else in the park, even Kahuku Southwest, typically is the one that gets all that bad gas, all green during that same time frame. So there you go. And again, I kind of wanted to check out just a little, little um, touch base once more, more with our state of Hawaii uh, air quality data website. And it's showing green across the whole state. You don't see anything even on our Hawaii island, any, anything even in the yellow. So that's why, we're, why we like to use that purple air site as well to get a little bit more information there. So earthquake wise, I'm going to show you guys first this page, which is uh, the main USGS earthquakes page. And we have on our, our plot here, just to remind me to tell you that uh, a red means in the last hour, orange in the last day, and yellow in the last week. So we're just seeing in the last week here, right? So I'll close this so we can see a little better. And so you can see that there's actually been an earthquake that was a 3.2 that just happened um, near the summit of Mauna Loa at a depth uh, above sea level. So within the, the edifice of the volcano. Um, but one earthquake by itself is not anything to be certainly alarmed about. Although I'm sure it's something that we will be talking about. What we're looking for as far as signs of unrest are changes in the till and the GPS and um, whole bunches of earthquakes happening all at once, all in a short time, like we were having in December before this eruption happened, as we we're reporting to you guys. So interesting to see one, one earthquake, and so Mauna Loa certainly is still feeling a long term on pace to erupt, but no short term changes worth mentioning at this point in time. Um, we still have our Pahala group of earthquakes on over here, kind of rumbling off. We have a couple on our south flank, and we have a little bit of, of, a, of an increase, not too many. And the ones around Kilauea Summit, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 1.9, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 1 1.8, 0 0.5. So most of those are very small earthquakes. I have all around caldera area and you know not in any kind of cluster of space where it'd be in a you, you think it's something related to magma moving probably more so to the ground 
deflating as it's sagging as it's releasing its pressure you know it's going to adjust all over the place right all the time it adjusts that in and out in and out which is why scientists use tilt meters and gps monitors and those things to track the changes on a volcano okay so uh we'll be getting to our, our questions here shortly but i'm going to kind of finish off here the information we have from usgs they do have on the usgs website as well a monitoring page and this one i wanted to point out to you guys if you look at this website web, web page it looks like there's a little bit more earthquakes on here it's just showing the last two weeks if you look at the legend for yellow, for orange is the last two days, and for the red it's the last two hours. So if I reload this, dare I try to reload it, to get that other earthquake back up on here. You know, it wants to give me Kilauea first, and so it's giving me the last two days. And then we see a similar pattern of a little bit of elevated activity around the summit area, a little bit of south flank activity, not much to speak of anywhere on the east rift or farther down, there's this area right in here. Nothing on the southwest rift at all. Let's zoom out here, and there is that Mauna Loa earthquake. Uh, reported as a 3.2. It just happened uh, about an hour ago. All right, so. And kind of the highlights of the text update, not to read everything to you guys, but the lava lake as of uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon, they say 194 meters, 634 feet, 36 feet deep, and perched 1 to 2 meters yards above its edge. Uh, SO2 emission rate still elevated. They say 3,400 tons a day on January 6th. Around a text update gives us a little bit more detail there. And still in that range of the pre-2018 lava lake. So uh, a brief steep, uh, steepening of the deflationary trend of the, t of the tilt. A few earthquakes and tremor. Nothing on the east surface when it's new. It's all still the same information that was there before. Um, they do say here, the lake observations, the west vent, vents spattered from the top of a small cone plastered in the northwest wall of Hale Maumau Crater. The dome fountain weakened yesterday morning, forcing lava to flow out of the formerly spattering vents on the northwest crater wall and into the lake for several hours yesterday. So that's interesting, right? We talked about that possibility uh, just a couple days ago. This morning, lava was flowing from the west vents through a crusted channel into the lake, and there may be a small dome fountain merged with the outflow from this channel. So maybe the most interesting thing that's happening now is that that kind of nozzle where the lava is going into the lake is what's changing, changing the most and, and changing shape and giving us different shapes of eruption products, right? Whether it's lava spattering out or flowing down a steep cone or hill or bubbling out the side or swelling up into a dome, right? Or different manifestations of that same, trying to get the gas out, out of there along with the lava that's really gassy. So as of Wednesday, the lake was still perched one or two meters above its narrow edges, but the eastern part of the lake appeared to be stagnating yesterday with occasional lava flowing across it. So that's where that information is coming from. USGS update. The main island of cooler solidified lava floating in the lake moved slightly to the east, while the 11 smaller islands, islands remained stationary on the east end of the lake. And then dimensions, and they actually say that uh, measurements Friday show that the Island's edges were six, meet, 6 meters 20 feet above the lake surface, and on Monday afternoon the 4th, they were 1 or 2 meters higher than that, 1 or 2 yards higher than that, right? So that means that the lava, the lava actually was gassier, and it was able to lift up the island, or the lava got, got less gassy, and it's kind of just receded down, because if it's less gassy, it can still hold up that same weight of the island. We know the island floats because it actually came up um, from that lower elevation below the vent to where now it's floating above the vent, right? And so maybe it's worth clarifying, you know, we've used the term island. This term island's, you know, been used going back um, hundreds of years, you know, but, you know, to be technically precise, this thing is not rooted, and so it's not exactly an island. It looked like it might have got rooted for, for a few hours there, but then it became unrooted, so maybe it was trying to be a rooted island, but it was actually still this kind of floating raft of material, right? That's kind of cinder, cinder material and bubbly lava, all kind of in another lava plaster that's all been bo bobbing upwards in this rising lava lake. And it could w well be being eroded at the bottom as well. There's other possibility is that if it actually, if there are pieces falling off the bottom of it, as the lava is circulating below it and kind of pushing it this way and pushing it that way, maybe some piece of it falls off and then the thing gets a little bit lighter and can, can float a little bit higher, something like that. So interesting thing to track. We'll kind of look, look for more more development in that story, and that's kind of why I read and show you guys this text update, even though it might be kind of 
not as visually pleasing here to show you guys this text. So, but that's why it's important, and um, that's what we'll, we'll, where we'll leave it for today. Um, just kind of switching over to um, to Twitter here and looking for any more information, and we kind of see all the recent uh, pictures we'll go through here shortly um, as we address your questions, which we will take next. So, Dana, if you want to line us up some questions here, we will um, pause at this point and uh, update to address some of my people what might be going on in our viewers' minds. All right, well, let's hop into them then. Uh, before we do that, I just want to say that, you know, we're brought to you by Hawaii Tracker on hawaiitracker.com. Uh, if you would like to support this stream, there's three big ways to do that. The first is share this stream onto your social media platforms. We don't have the advertising budget that many of the other news organizations. So just sharing it across your own uh, platforms really helps. Second way is on hawaiitracker.com. You can make a one-time donation there or become a member, right, and uh, share your story, share information. Or the third way is, and the, the big way to help us out is becoming a monthly supporter also on hawaiitracker.com slash support. And that's the real ways to keep us providing this type of content. And with that, let's dive into some questions, right? So the first one I've been seeing today and yesterday, and we've covered probably two or three times already, but they just, I think it's the anxiety. Uh, it has to do with the steam, right? It, in the lower East Rift zone from the 2018 eruption, everybody uh, that has been following before would know that these, these uh, fissures, they still steam and they no reason to think they're going to stop steaming anytime soon. And also there's a great deal of variance between them. So people are wondering about, is there an increase of steam, more steam than usual or than usual, you know, what is usual, but, um, and uh, can you just address that real quick? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the steam is something we hear about a lot and it's something that varies. Um, it, it kind of varies from, before the whole Leilani eruption, we'd hear it in the national park all the time. It's like, oh, it's, there's more steam coming out of the steam vents today. Now, there's less today. There's more today. And it seems like it really varies more so with something to do with how much rain you've had, not necessarily like that day, but the, 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 the sum of the few days before that. Um, and um, also the, the conditions in the air. So if it's a little bit cooler, you might see more steam. If it's a little bit warmer, you might see less steam. So, you know, just the last couple of nights have been actually quite cool, at least here around um, the upper part of Kilauea. I don't know what about down there, Danny. Maybe you can address that as well. And you can address your observations of what you see down at Fisher 8 changing, right? But we just see this pattern a lot of, you know, the steam kind of starts and stops and starts and stops and kind of some days more, some days less. And we're more interested in SO2 amounts and that doesn't seem to have changed. Right. The steam is just really volatile in what you uh, visually see. Right, it all, it's a lot like fog. It has to do with the dew point, right? And just the weather conditions are the main driver. And the second driver on that is the, the, the wind direction, right? Because normally the predominant winds are gonna be blowing from the west to the east with a little bit of north to south action going on with it as well. When it flips to a southern wind and it starts blowing from the south to the north then it drags the, uh, the H2S mostly from the vents into the residential neighborhood of Leilani. And then people start, you know, smelling it and that triggers all kinds of things. But me personally going around and I drive up to Fisher 8 every day, you know, walk around on it. Uh, the, not like on it, on it, but, you know, like walk around right beside it on the streets. And there's really nothing really that has struck me as being out of the ordinary. Right. It, there's a big variance. And especially since it's been so cold. Like, yeah, that just means a little bit more steam. It's when those hot, sunny days with, you know, low humidity, yeah, you're not going to hardly see them. But days like, today, you know, in the morning, overcast, cold, yeah, that's, that's, you're setting up for some steam there. But that's just me. And then Fisher 18, I haven't been down, but, you know, to it specifically, but I don't see any reason to think of it as any different than the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see if we if we get some more data, some more information, and looking at something like that. You know, uh, maybe we can check into it a little bit for a little bit further. But most of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, this is just a variation in the atmosphere, atmospheric conditions, and then recent rainfall slash groundwater flow. So if it rained a lot uphill, 
maybe a month before that, I could be moving through you and you might not have any idea that something like that's happening. So that makes it extra, extra tricky is, you know, we're, I, I don't know that we have, that we, we, we can track the groundwater to that level of precision that we know, oh, now there's going to be a pulse of more steam or less steam. It'll be interesting to, to tell. Right. Okay. All right. All right. So next question. Um, more looking towards, I think there might have been a little bit of this in the beginning, but I didn't see any photos of it. But uh, volcano lightning or dirty lightning, you know, mm -hmm. like what causes that effect? And um, just a little bit of info on that. Um, I know we had a consistently for months during the 2018 eruption in Leilani, like just weather systems isolated, anchored over Leilani, just thunderstorms, twist, uh, what were the twisters called? The lava nados that we were lava nados. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All Not, kinds of yeah. weird uh, weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, you talk about the dirty lightning or the volcano volcanic lightning. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things here. I just want to kind of point out. So in some of, some of the images over here that we've shown you guys, you, you do see quite a lot of heat in these early steam clouds. And so there's, there is that aspect of there is a lot of material actually moving through a small space through there, right? And in this case, it's it's the steam. But it could also have little bits of, of ground rock, which are ash, right? And so it's more the, the friction of the ash rubbing on ash that can create that static electricity that can then discharge through lightning. And that's common and you have when you have the more explosive eruptions that have a lot you know like those really dark gray ash clouds right those that's the you know, those dirty ex dirty kind of ash emissions that you often have that much friction going on inside of that ash cloud and you can have lightning happening within it too so uh certainly that's 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 possible you know, i didn't it's hard to see from this the scaled thermal camera you know the thermal camera is the best imagery that we have um but you can't see if it's really um lightning in there from this image or not you know and plus these things right are and it's once yeah. every five minutes you get a single frame right like, so maybe yeah. maybe on usgs if they're you know actually release their second by second frame maybe we could tell something on that at some point but that's that's what would be what it would take detected right there but certainly yeah and you know and, and certainly um during the 2018 eruption you know all the massive amounts of heat that were rising up that was, was a big part of it also that heat was creating its own weather system right and that weather system would dump huge amounts of rain and it would have lightning as well just from a sheer amount of material, you know, uh, water vapor, um, everything all combined, right? The mass SO2 and, you know, a lot of water comes out of the volcano as well, just for the magma as well, not just what's entrained from the ground that's around there. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. Doesn't it have to do with like the, the static in the ash generating electricity with these dirty thunderstorms? Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it turns out that you know the ash, ash particles are slightly electrically charged, right? You know, there's like a slight electric charge across an ash particle, and so that's why right. if you start rubbing them together, then you can create the static to to exactly discharge it, as as you say. Right. All right. So going into the next one, um, at the current rate of lava intrusion at the summit, you know, in the lava lake, when is it expected to reach the rim? Quote unquote. So there's, you know, the first thing we have to say is there's probably like six or seven rims that you could identify and make some kind of argument that they're important or not. Um, so when you're saying the rim, it's like the rim of the collapse pit, the rim of the down drop block, the rim of the higher up down drop block, or the rim of the caldera as a whole, or the rim of where it slumps over to kill away Iki, like, cause that's a little bit less than everywhere else type of thing. So th there's a few rims, right? But go ahead and all right. What can you do with that question? All right. So since we've answered this one before, we still have all the stuff here. And I'll show you guys the stuff that we have. So as far as the first question, which is the actual rim? So I think there's three kind of choices that seem reasonable, right? As far as what could the rim be? Choice number one is this greenish line right in here. That's the 800 meter contour. Right, maybe slightly below that. By that point, by 800 meters, there's a one lava flow that's coming onto this upper flat piece of land next to the big hole. Right, that could be one of the rim. That's probably the, the lowest definition of rim you could get away with. And so we'll, we'll look at like that's option one, and then option two would be the uh, the 900 meter. What happened to the 900 meter? I don't see it up there exactly, but the 900 meter goes somewhere 
like this. Yeah, up in there. And it holds this part over here as well. And it does something like that. That's the 900 meter. That's the you know answer option B. That's acceptable as the rim. By that point, it has this this big block of flat stuff to pour out onto. And then the final acceptable answer of rim. Well, I know that's we'll call that maybe not the final. So we have A is 800. B is 900. C is this one 1060. The elevation of where we actually come to the edge of this upper down drop block over here. And I might have to pan this over so you guys can see. Right there is the edge of the main caldera floor. There's you guys who are around here, familiar volcano houses over there. So when you have a volcano house, you look back in this direction like that. Right? And so that that new crack that formed in 2018 is this one. And that rim is at 1060 elevation. And then the final one is actually down here. You can't quite see it on this map, but kind of off the bottom right over here, there's an 1100 meter kind of largest possible highest point you can think of as a whole caldera is how we define that one, right? And so here is what the model is. This is based on USGS 10 meter, cubic meters per second is what they reported us in our most recent or last week's Volcano Watch as their uh, eruption rate. And so on that pace, um, where we are now is essentially, you know, right right around that, right on pace on area in the 190s of uh, depth. And so to actually get to that inner crater full at that rate would be somewhere around February 24th for option A, right? That's 800 meter elevation, that's option A. And then we got to zoom out on this plan because actually once it gets to that wider spot, it can't fill quite as steeply. It has to slow down a little bit and go at a slightly slower rate. So to get to 900, it's actually more around July, sometime around July, if that your if your option B is your answer. If your option is 1060, then you're over here around September 2022, as as spilling out to where it can go maybe below the you know towards the bottom of the volcano house and that big flat area over there where the last floor that covered it was like in 1919 and 1974 71 and if your final option is 1100 where it can actually spill all the way out of the whole caldera and go somewhere outside of that zone then it goes to the south in the national park where there is no inhabitants and that is uh, well into 2023 so over two years away so if you want to know the, the longest answer would be two years um the shortest answer would be maybe another month and a half to two months or so depending on a very very variable emission yeah. eruption rate yeah so that's that's the thing is yeah. that it could go down be going down and it could, that every time it goes down it extends it makes it delays it sets it back longer and right. longer and longer so right, right all right yeah so let's get into the next one uh Philip, is that moonshine you're drinking? It is That's not. This is oh, go to okay. water. <laughs> um, they're talking. Uh, one of the questions was about the from YouTube, the second biggest island uh, floating around inside the lava lake, mm -hmm. and he was uh, suggesting that it looked to him like it was uh, connected to the bottom with some kind of like slag type type connection. Uh, but you know, you had, you were talking about the littler islands too, so can maybe go back over the the smaller of the islands. Yeah, so I'm kind of let's see if I can kind of rewinding for you guys and back and forth here, right? So you can see that here early on we have. I'm gonna change my. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but we have a chunk over here that becomes the other smaller islands, and a bigger chunk over here that becomes the main big, big island. And so if I advance it a little bit for you guys, you can kind of see there's almost like a crescent right there. They separate. There's a crescent over here. That's all one together. And then one other big piece of island that's over here. Let me go back to my yellow. One big island over here and that other little piece separated over here. So in a little bit more detail, advance a little more. That thing breaks into two. Right, there's one chunk over here one chunk over here and they're kind of spinning in opposite directions presumably because the flow from the middle is coming this way and they're spinning away from it yeah both ways that's kind of what breaks breaks it apart is being in a path right there all right and then they go under right in this area right in here 
And where's the cursor? They stay under, stay under, stay under. Maybe pop back up a little bit in here, but really you don't see them much. And there we see it, that other piece kind of come into view and other little ones over there. So I'll keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And now is when all these chunks, this big chunk of group of, I don't know, another eight or so or 10 islands, eight or nine islands comes up together. And then they spread over <laughs> to over there where they are now. And then right around here, they park themselves somewhere in the area of here. Now they're parked in this kind of configuration. They haven't moved a whole lot. Oh, free myself. This one over here is still moving. It's closest to the center. It does move a little bit there, the outside. And so that second big, biggest island looked like it might have been connected to the big one as well early on, especially over here. Right, but it also separates at some point in air and drifts away. So it certainly probably has a deeper root than the smaller ones, but it seems like it's, it's not deep enough that maybe it's also stuck over there on that far side of the, the south side of the cooling crust of that lava lake. So we'll leave it at that. All right. So um, next one, it's about the initial eruption, right? When we went from water lake to lava lake and about 30 mm -hmm. minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Why did lava come up through the, the sides of the crater instead of erupting through the bottom? Well, it's, 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 it's mostly to do with, with how the crater cracked when it was collapsing before. And so when you have craters that form, they form these kind of ring faults. If you look at my bow, they make rings, they're circular in shape. And that's what allows the, the kind of piston head to drop down and in as the top of the crater collapses in as whatever was holding it below gets pulled away for whatever reason, eruption nearby or move somewhere else. Those are the typical kind of things. So um, that's, that's, that's really it. So you kind of have like a, almost like a plug that's in the middle and you have cracks on the outside and it wants to come up around the cracks. Of course, we had a lot of earthquakes and there's a lot of rubble and our plug is maybe like a rubble plug, a bunch of rubble kind of loose in there. But still, the cracks is where things settle the most and where it moves the easiest and where you can move stuff out of the way the easiest. And that's just kind of, you know, if, if you if you think about you know, what, what, a, what a structural geologist will do is they'll you know, calculate all the stresses that that exist on any surface, right? So you're on a, on, a, on a flat ground surface, then you have the stress of gravity coming down and you have the stress in the rock that's kind of pushing it this way or that way. And it has different strengths in different directions. And so when you have a cliff face that kind of changes, you don't no, no longer working with a flat surface. And that's kind of, it just works out that you have a lot of the, the stress fields bend toward cliff edges, right? So you can actually, the lava likes to go to the cliff edge and erupt out of the cliff edges. It's just something that happens a lot. It's, you know, um, we've observed it and it just, um, it works out with the math. And it's, you know, intuitively the way I, you know, I think of it is, I think of it as that rubble plug in the middle and that weakness is around the outside from where it kind of collapsed and cracked originally. All right, so this is looking like the last one that I got lined up for you. Um, looking at the 2018 uh, fissures in the Lower East Rift Zone. You know, we've heard several people ask about them. We heard it uh, today as well. Uh, is there any chance that those fissures are going to erupt again? Well, so, you know, there's those exact fissures are unlikely to erupt again. Um, it is a rift zone, so it's a matter of, of time frame when you look at what's going to erupt on a rift zone. So, but let me let me start off with with showing you guys. Um, let's see, what can we look at? Let's look at. Wasn't going to show you guys much to to your GPS here today, but I'll, I'll show you guys a little bit of this to your GPS. So this is the Jonica station that's that's down, you know, between Pool O and Highway One Thirty Two, and this station. Let me go back to my red here. This station is not really showing any real response, any change since that eruption began um, a couple of weeks, more a couple of weeks ago now, right? And this is unique for Jonica, right? You don't see it in that lower part of the East Rift. And if we look at the tilt, we'd see the same kind of pattern. If we go up to Pu'o, to the Pu'o area, we can actually can see that there was a response, right? That there essentially was a relief of pressure that happened also at Pu'o. This is kind of South Pu'o area and the North Pu'o area also had a had a response. And we see a response everywhere up the rift from there, but we don't see it down a rift from Pu'o. Pu'o is where it stops, right? There's the boundary right there. So 
right now, if it's going to come out, it's going to come out of any of the weaknesses that exist. There's a barrier that exists right here again, right? That's the barrier that had to collapse on April 30th, 2018 to allow the lava to start moving underground towards Leilani in the first place before the big earthquake and everything else, the other knockout punches came. That's the barrier that broke and that We have a barrier there again, it appears. That barrier is there again. So the weak spots would be out of it, all, all that weak ground around Puo'o as option as an option, right? What about farther up? Kamuamoa, another place that erupted recently. Another ground is weak there also. It could erupt there as well, right? Or Kananuyohamo, also showing a response, but and also has erupted recently, but um, plenty of weak ground around there as well, right? The last father's eruption was essentially there in 2006, I want to say. Uh, Mana'ulu, it's been a while, but five years lava came out of the ground there for long eruption it's responding that's another that's right. Right, right where the bend of the rift zone actually is it yeah that's what i was thinking it, yeah. it that's a candidate the ground is weak there also and look over here you know by the caldera is where it's the weakest because that's where it actually broke out of all those places where the ground is weak that it has to get to progress through to get to where it's got to break through some barrier to get somewhere no one in the lower east rift zone has anything to worry about from this eruption Right, and it didn't even, uh, the one thing about it breaking barriers is once the lava, the level of the lava lake got a little bit over the vent, that created, it seemed like that created enough of a barrier, or there had to be a coincidence that it just got covered and then the vent shut off. But it looked like, you know, it didn't even have the pressure to get through that, and would rather go find an easier path than just bubbling through, right? That's not a lot of pressure right there. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 almost like it's a fickle thing, right? So it doesn't take a whole, you know, it's that, and that might be one line of evidence that someone might might invoke in believing that the eruption won't last that much longer. Because if it's that fickle, then how how can it sustain any other change that happens when it reaches the vent again, or if something clogs it, or you know, I mean, who knows? If it's that fickle, that you know that you know that's kind of one line, line of argument. Uh, opposite point of view being, well, the gases are sustained, eruption rate is sustained, and you know, unless we have more data, that's what we what we've been told. And there's no sign on that point of view from it actually slowing down, apart from the tilt still kind of sagging at a fairly slow rate on a slight speed up yesterday. Right. We'll see once it uh gets to that if it does get to that vent but it's still got what another hundred feet up to that vent roughly it's something Maybe like that i gotta pull back the pull back my chart here um that vent it has like just you know 20, back of the envelope 20 meters ish so yeah 60 70 feet or so maybe oh wow so it's come up yeah it's been coming up yeah so some, somewhere in the range of that, you know, yeah, it's, and of course it takes it, long, it gets slower and slower the farther up, it, farther up it comes. And right. it's going to slow down a lot more if it gets any higher above that upper, that, that innermost rim right there. One last question. You are maybe the most qualified person to answer this one. Uh, if Puo erupted again, how likely is it go to go towards Fern Forest? Well, it's, uh, it's, that's something that actually happened a little bit in the 2014-15 era, I want to say, when we had the Kahawalea flows, the one lava, you know, right. had, had, with a TEB vent, the lava was kind of going both north and south, and that can happen, you know, long. right. But what often happens was, was when it goes down both ways at the same time, and it keeps both paths open, is that the south vet, the south path becomes an easier way out because you relieve pressure quicker. It's going down here hill faster, and if you can get to all the way to the ocean and have an empty open nozzle that just pours it all everything out into the ocean, then even better, you know. So kind of once that south flow got going, then a north flow is petered out, and that's what usually happens. So it's less likely to have a flow that's bigger coming from that area. We don't see any gigantic lava shields on that east rift zone that would that would indicate a giant flow going north into Fern Forest or Eden Rock. The area that covered that area before the forest came over was the area Kilauea Iki, where there was a big lava shield over there. And so if that area was the one erupting if there was a fissure and a summit up on a critter wall of Kilauea Iki, then all the volcano communities are going to, are going to be more worried about that, about it at that point, right? But that's what it takes. It takes it being on that side and knock on wood that that never happen, happens in their lifetime here. Right. All right. Well, that does it for me um, on the question end. It, we'll get to any new other questions that we get passed on the next episode. All right. Yeah. So we'll keep going here and show you guys some of the imagery that's been put out by the USGS here. And so. This is a picture that they've put out of the 
island or floating island or the raft or you know um, someone suggested lava berg and you know some, something i've term i've used before but that maybe isn't an accurate either because it's not actually lava in the middle it's a rock right it's lava rock berg so whatever that thing is and whatever we call it right there there it is here in the middle you can see the western vent over here on the right and the entry point is over there so this is actually a high res image so we can zoom in quite a bit so I'm going to click on here and show you guys a little, a little bit Enhanced. better view. Enhanced it, yeah. Digital enhancement. So there is the actual upwelling point. You can see that by this point, there is no dome anymore. Right, It's kind of a flat surface sheet. And I can't quite see, but maybe there was a flow coming down somewhere over here as well. And you can see a little bit of red lava flowing up the, out of the top right, right here. Maybe this is what's going on. It looks like there's some red lava up here. Maybe it's flowing down during one of those plugging events right this stuff over here looks, looks freshish also like it might have been popped out recently too whereas over here i don't see anything that looks anything anything quite like that right more up here this seems to be the the, the overflow where it's, it's actually forced it higher forced the chimney higher which is interesting i wonder if you know what it looks like on top as far as whether it's still venting gas and there's an open vent or whether there's lava blocking it or it's narrowed it. So that's kind of interesting to see, see how that changes or if it falls over or all, all that kind of stuff. Right. And, these, and this, this is kind of hard to get a, get a scale, right? We have, we, you know, at some point, we'd like to superimpose some people on here or something, right? But this thing is this... I don't remember how tall this is. I don't know if Dan remembers or not, but... Right, that's what we're calculating. It's still the height of the lava to the lake. is something upwards of 60, 70 to 100 feet, somewhere in that range. Let's see if this thing made it taller or not up here at the very end. I'm not sure about that. So, and that's kind of one area. You can zoom in onto the island as well, and you can see where the lava's made this ledge, black ledge on the side of it. And on the interior of that is where you see all the tephra. It looks like a cinder cone almost, right? You see big chunks, like cracks in the edge of a cinder cone. And you essentially did have a cinder cone falling into the lava, into that, into that water lake early on when that thing was fountaining before put out any kind of lava flow, right? So that's that's kind of what that looks like on the top, at least. Kind of zoomed into it here. Right, remember, this is like a seven-acre piece of land. And so it's got its own little hill over here or something. I'm just like a, I'm not sure what's happening in this, this dark spot over here. Maybe it's a shadow. High spots gas vent steaming crack coming out of it over here so very interesting there so all right we'll, we'll kind of move on from there you guys can, can explore that some more on your own another image here of the the lava edge the edge of that perched pond there with an overflow kind of spilling over the side of it over here going both ways and then there's the edge of it again right there all right so the thing's spilling over the top and then coming over this looks like it might be well, it's hard to tell which edge this actually is. This might be that western edge of it, that where it's the widest area to kind of go down. And so, likewise, we can we can also enhance this one. And there is that overflow point. You can kind of see it's not that much above there, the surface. And every time it sloshes over, it's going to leave another layer of lava that makes it a little bit higher. Once this thing stops flowing and cools, it's going to essentially make a little barrier, and then it's going to spill over somewhere else next time it does it. That's kind of how it builds up the swimming pool edge over here right? and otherwise you see the crust forming is forming is kind of almost like sausage like long plates they have, kind of have an arcuate shape and going off over here so and there's the edge of the island too and so we can kind of zoom in on it and look there's some very red rock that's probably some baked cinder baked from floating around on the lava lake as you can imagine there's some of that cinder is actually sticking out of the lava right in here it's part of, partly what's underneath there with whatever gas bubbles and bubbly lava is attached to it so over here you can kind of look and see nice lava crust this looks like it might, might have been a big bubble in the crust of the lava flow so this is the kind of thing we're talking about as far as bubbly lava it's like you know big airspace with lot, like thin lava edges that if you kind of coat it with enough lava you can kind of trap and make a kind of honeycomb kind of float that's we imagine is what's holding this thing up in that lava lake. So I'm back in here. So we'll move on from that as well. These are some images that were released yesterday from the USGS. And here's another view um, kind of from above, from the more 
typical camera vantage point with that western vent at the lower edge of our view here. This is when the island had, had drifted quite close, and here's all the smaller ones off to the side. You can see the spider pattern is a little bit smaller, and it's quite localized to this area right between the island and the vent, and you don't really see it anywhere else apart from that, and that might be why the, the flow is, at least on the surface, stag was stagnating a little bit. And of course, it also depends on whether the lava coming in is slightly more dense or slightly less gassy or those kind of things. And that's why the gas emissions are also so important. Okay. So looking at the chronology today, let me just refresh it to make sure that they're, we catch up to them as well. Since they're doing a, fant uh, a fantastic job of putting out a lot of information for everyone to, to enjoy here. So um, this is something they put out regarding floating islands and lava lake, January 1917 to January 2021 comparison. This is something we showed you guys in the previous broadcast. We'll kind of, as our historical component today, we'll recap a little bit of just visually what some of the islands have looked like on a volcano in the past. So we'll kind of move on and show you guys that there's those picture, those uh, videos we showed you guys earlier. This is showing a deployment of geologists walking along an old Shader Craters Road, Crater Room Drive, I'm sorry, broken center line over here, and they are installing uh, seismic instrumentation to better quantify what's happening in the ground there. So not only are they walking out along the road, they're also flying in. That's why they're wearing a flight suit and flight helmet. And there is the culprit that landed these guys on that down drop blocks and kind of see they're inside of that lower ledge of the crater, right? So if this this is that 1060 uh, mark that we're putting on a map and down here is, is around a nine, 900 elevation somewhere near. Yeah, so I guess they're 300 feet inside this big piece of land that has still has grass growing on it down in there. So that's what they have for us today on their um, update. They did have a Volcano Watch put out this week as well. And this is about their Tefra lab that they, they talk about how they're going to analyze, be able to analyze in-house all the, the chemistry of lava, lava, which is an important thing for monitoring where it comes from, which then helps us with the, the, the forecasting and the dynamics and everything else that kind of goes along with it. So I won't kind of read through all the details of that, but if you're interested in all the details of that, you can kind of go through and please enjoy their Volcano Watch article. You know, um, I did want to point out also that they, there are a few more pictures as well. I'll show you guys this extra, right, is that they actually have a little bit of a different image, image here of their um, uh, machinery that's measuring um, density, the size, the porosity, all these different um, aspects of the rock, which then allow them to to quantify more than just where did the magma come from, but like how, how much gas was it, and what temperature was the gas at, and all those kind of things that might be more interesting to to track the, the magma underground. So there's a microscope lab right there, and there might be one more here where they put out, put out their cam sizer machine, where they actually can can scan it through through this thing. Yeah, so um, can measure tens of thousands of fragments in as little as five minutes. And then they also can, you know, do 2D shape, right? And stay, yeah, some of the other, other instrumentation is interesting. They use nitrogen gas, nitrogen gas to measure density. So more details on that you guys can check out there. And so what kind of wanted to just kind of to get us um, just to touch on one point that USGS is coming on on a question here about that lava island as well. So how is there a fairly stable island if solidified lava is denser than liquid lava and it will sink? I presume the island is less stable because it's less dense. Is that because it's a different composition or is it more pumice-like with air bubbles? And so this is a question where you often get, and if we haven't quite got it yet, and, uh, you know, that's why I've addressed it already a couple of times today, is that they um, are also stating that they think it's more like pumice and some of it formed during an explosive reaction of lava flowing into the old water lake. And there's also seen to have some lava over, over top it the first day, which forms plates that buckled on the surface. And then it was overtopped by pumice-like material from the early fountains. So, and then they, they kind of hint, such islands have been seen at Kilauea Lava Lakes before. Stay tuned for a little bit of proof. And then, then that's where that other post came from, following up on that. So, but what I'm going to show you guys today, um, before we take our last round of questions here, um, just visually, a little visual history of, of some of these uh, lava islands over time. And so... 
The first one here is uh, the one I'm just going to introduce you guys to this. This is a picture of William Ellis. William Ellis was a first missionary kind of Western explorer that wrote things down on the volcano. And so he actually came to Kiloe in 1823. And, you know, these might not be exactly the same thing as we're, as we're talking about here, as far when we discuss islands. But um, what he is uh, describing here, when he, the terms he actually uses are islands. So he describes at the time where, let me see if I can find the spot here. Uh, he arrives and sees uh, immediately before us yawned an immense gulf in the form of a crescent about two miles in length from northeast to southwest, nearly a mile in width and apparently 800 feet deep. The bottom was covered with lava, and the southwest and northern parts of it were one vast flood of burning matter, in a state of terrific ebullition, rolling, rolling to and fro its fiery surge and flaming billows. Fifty-one conical islands of varied form and size, containing so many craters, rose either around the edge or from the surface of the burning lake. Twenty-two of them constantly emitted smokes of gray, or columns of gray smoke, or pyramids of brilliant flame, and several of these at the same time vomited from their ignited mouths streams of lava which rolled in blazing torrents down their black indented sides into the boiling mass below. So that's, those are William Ellis's words in describing the scene here that someone later came in and covered, but he actually has a sketch of this where he stopped and sketched out the scene here at the southwest side of this, of this pit, right? But so um, there might be, you know, a crater over here, like on a wall, on a crack, and there's certainly some kind of over here and some kind of floating in the middle too. And it's hard to tell if that could be like some kind of island with vents on it or not. But one thing to kind of just, just put, put this in context is we had a, a, a big collapse, big explosion in 1790. It was the most, most uh, lethal eruption of Kilauea. For sure, when it killed a, a big party of Hawaiian, tra Hawaiian travelers and warriors. Um, that f caused a giant crater within the summit of Kilauea. And that's where we have our reports from the oral tradition of perhaps four different water bodies, little ponds, puddles down, down there within these different craters. Um, and so between 1790 and 1823, in those 33 years, the lava certainly had come back. And, and there were a lot, of a lot of flows on the Southwest Rift Zone at the time. I know I'm kind of getting into it just as was one, one story with this one slide right here, but we'll move on quickly after this. For people who are, imag are imagining if lava, how quickly is lava coming back, imagine that the lava came back from an eruption with 51 cones around the side. Like, that means like, the fissures are not just in one spot, but lava is coming out of possibly 51 or the 22 places at the same time. Rather than, you know, we had the, 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 the northern fissure, we had that center fissure, upper and lower, and we had the western fissure, upper and lower. And so he, this guy's talking about 51 different places instead. So in comparison, this doesn't seem like nearly that rate of lava coming out as it might have refilled the collapse to be all the way full again like this within those those few years and so but that's something we want to keep in mind and kind of look back at as we look back at the history of Kilauea but we're going to kind of show you guys here just a little bit more quickly the visual history like you know what what he described as islands so maybe it were more another view of that through a painting uh, from the Hawaii Legacy Archive over here and something a little bit a little bit more familiar now might look like islands within the lava here, painted by Lionel Walden from the Honolulu Academy of the Arts there. So, 1880s. This is a series I showed you guys in an update recently from Frank Perret, right? And here is in the 1911 lava island that has this kind of narrow spot that we think was where the lava was bubbling up, with the biggest bubbles, and so that's where it wore away at the bottom, eventually causing it to collapse and to sink. And there's that narrow spot once again right in there. And we'll advance and here it is sinking so I'll let that kind of clear off the screen and you guys can kind of see there just the tip of that thing sticking out now of the lava right there and one more even less of it sticking out a few hours later and then the big bubble glass that formed above the sinking thing right as all the gas that was trapped inside of it also was able to escape right and following that twin islands that formed above the island after it came back up and sank again because of the convection currents in in that lava lake also formed cooling islands in 1911 above that sinking mass there's 1916 nice view familiar it looks like an island floating in the lava and possibly some other little islands here too 
right? So I see this is common. Here's a picture also 1911 from a little bit higher higher perspective from Jagger. So you can kind of see here what could be that one island over there that might be kind of almost stuck to the shore and another one over here more in the middle. And with some clear lava liquid surface all through here all around and it's like maybe some a bigger plate stuck over here. Right? But there's our islands there and there. 1916. Painting by Twig Smith, 1917. This is where we start seeing this familiar double crag island right here. It has this distinctive profile right, that's been painted a few times right over there. So this is Twig Smith in 1917 painting it. And that's the one that matches what was released by the USGS, this other 1917 picture. You know, here's one taken from the lava surface at the edge of this lava lake. So I'm walking up to the edge of it here and seeing that same feature in profile. A three panel by Walden, 1917 as well, right? Showing that kind of spire feature over here. And it looks like another island over here, possibly too. 1918, and I won't circle the islands every time anymore. You can see there's 1918. 1920, now nah, I will circle them because they're a little bit lower, right? How, look how, how they seem to have sunk or lava levels come up. You can see right in there, right? And some higher older chunks. So this, these might have been other islands from the past that kind of got moored as the lava froze around them and attached to the sides of the crater there, right? So it's interesting to see how those kind of crags and other features can form on the edge of the lake as well. 1911 here. Jagger once again, and quite a lot. Maybe I can zoom. Oh, zoom. I don't know if I can actually zoom in there, but no, I can't. 1921. 1934. That was that one month eruption in a post 1924 era, and that looked like a suspiciously like an island over there on the edge, floating in that thing too. Right? Hard to tell from the from a smaller picture there. 1952. We had events coming up for the middle, but we actually have bits of cinder cone, right? Whether they're actually rooted underneath that lava flow that's drowning them, right? But they appear as islands. Maybe these are actually more satisfactory and being the right term as an island since they're rooted on the ground over there. And 1967 to 68. So it looks like I might have a bigger island there and maybe, maybe this might be pieces of crust, right? But that's a candidate as well for having something happening right here. It looks like there's almost a steam vent in the middle of that thing in 1967. A lava lake that lasted uh, eight and a half months, right? You can kind of see another feature. It's also perched up above the outer wall of the crater, right? And it's also spilling over making a spillover flow over here. Right? So that's the thing that typically happens. Um, you know, it's not going to occupy the whole crater wall to wall full of lava. It's going to kind of um, have an optimal surface that's the ideal for it to keep the surface open to release heat, but also not, not, to, not to lose it too fast. Yeah. So that's the last, the last one of that sequence there. So, Dane, um, with that, I just want to remind everyone that we're brought to you by Hawaii Tracker, hawaiitracker.com. We can see in non-video form as well as our video updates, um, all little nuggets of information about Kilauea's eruption, other Hawaii Island um, uh, information as well. So um, check us out there. And, Dane, if you want to give us another round of questions, and then lead us out. Right. So I'm going to kind of rework these questions a little bit because they're interesting questions, but they're they're asked a little weird. Um, so this one's about the weight of the island uh, causing an eruption. And instead of just thinking about like the weight of the island uh, pushing down, I want maybe to address the Jonica flow, right? Where it pinched like in the, the south flank or maybe that sequence would be interesting to review and how uh, you can get an eruption without the supply from depth or resupply or it's just magma stored under in a pocket in the ground and then something causes it to get to the surface. Yeah, so um, it's it's I'm not sure, but, but maybe maybe I'll answer by answer it by showing showing it this way. Right. Um, one other thing that let's see if I can get it over here. Okay, so one other thing that we've, that we've we've discussed a little bit is how the lava is going to cool against the edges first and the bottom and the sides, right? And kind of it's it's a big mass. And you know, in fact, the USGS has mentioned I don't didn't have it don't have it pulled up here, but they did mention at one point that they are seeing some local deformation from the weight 
of lava in that crater. So you would expect there to be some local ground settling right around where lava actually is physically pouring onto, especially if it's coming from some, some area right below there that's emptying out and it's kind of replacing it. Then you might see, you know, or if it's from the side, you might even see like a little bit of a tilting less here and a little bit more there on a very subtle way that you actually can see. But what happens more often, what typically we do see, what I think we might expect to see at some point in the future is after the eruption is over, um, and you know, who knows how long it's going to last, right? But what often happens is once these things form a solid crust, they still stay liquid in the middle a lot longer. And so it kind of cools from the outside in and from the top the fastest, but there ends up being a core of liquid lava still that persists for over, th in this case, it was over 30 years, right? With a 440 foot thick uh, um, pile of lava within the crater. So I put up this image that I haven't shown you guys, I don't think as much before, but this is, uh, 1960 collapse following the, the Kapoho eruption of 1960 and the Kiloiki eruption of 59. And there was actually a lava lake that was exactly that, kind of still liquid in the middle and just sitting there underground in a pocket. And this is why I choose, choose to answer this, this way, Dane, because I have this lined up already. Um, and so there was a movement of the ground and that magma was able to, in this case, erupt out of a crack and pour down into that lower pit that was collapsing above right so there's kind of a, a, a you know it's like stepping on a donut kind of thing it can kind of it can kind of squirt out and then settle back down kind of thing and likewise you can have pockets within a rift zone like a Janica, or you can have pockets elsewhere right you know that that can get kind of pinched um but that's it's 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 kind of an odd oddball situation it's not it's not the typical thing that happens right but it's something that once you know at the summit especially when you start having Lava lakes piling on top of lava lakes, lava flows on top of lava flows that are, you know, year after year after year, then you can start having more commonly this kind of thing happening, right? Where you do see some bits of lava draining from one spot to the other, or, you know, the lot, you know, you see different, you know, lava lakes are what's normal on Kilauea, so it's all about having different views of them. And in this case, it poured in from above, lasted a couple of days and stopped, and that was that. All right. If I recall. Do you want to. Um... Thank uh, some new donators uh, helping us out, you know, on the hawaiitracker.com slash support. Uh, Gary B made a donation and also our uh, friend, the photographer, Janice Way. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you, Gary. So thank you, Janice. guys. Um, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I think they were on to about my last question I have lined up here. So All looking right. at the, the island. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, one more. Looking at that island, right, that's in the middle of the lake, um, mm -hmm. could it possibly thin out to the point where lava squirts out of it again in, like, a thin spot in the, the berg? You know, maybe as it's uh, do, going through one of those sinking, if it does sink, like the one that you showed earlier? Yeah, it, it, it seems like possibly yes, right? But for that to happen, eruptions got to last a long time. It has to... Ideally, right now it's different from what we have now from what that picture of 1911 was, is the lava is bubbling up from below in that case. And so now it's kind of falling in from above. So we, right. you'd want to have the island actually above, if it came above that, that spot and the lava was welling up below it, right? Or if it rises up enough to get above a vent and it's above a vent, then you can have that kind of thing more likely happening, right? Or if you open a new crack that's, you know, underneath a lava lake, you know, I mean, it's... That's kind of crazy to think about, but you know, there was an eruption and I want to say it was a lie crater. I have to look it up, look up for you guys. It might've been a lie where the fissure opened up, lava filled the entire crater in 24 hours. The fissure widened, the whole crater drained all the way full of lava, then they erupted again and refilled all the way full of lava again. So there can, it can be some wild swings of, of magma moving around to the surface and back underground, you know, um, through these, in these void areas, especially where there's a lot of cracks. So, yeah. All right. Well, that does it for me on the question in, you know, thank you, Phil. I'll let you, you know, wrap this thing up. Yeah. So thank you guys. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we got for you guys today. You know, um, kind of in summary, you know, there's, you know, that we had the, it, it, we haven't had a whole lot of major changes in the volcano. It's still releasing pressure. It's still putting out a bunch of gas and when the gas is still kind of lingering in, in certain places in the Island. So we're going to, um, we know apart from if no major barring any major changes we'll come back to you guys you know um back in a new week on monday and update 
update you guys with what's happened over the weekend. You know, the signals, what's changing, what's interesting. We can kind of dive into a little more detail in depth. In, in depth. If you guys have any requests on anything special you want, like, covered, let us know. Um, we would take, we would do, you know, uh, try to, we still have some requests that we're following up on as well. So um, kind of keep them coming. And otherwise, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, yep. For Dane DuPont, Hawaii Tracker, HawaiiTracker.com, I'm Philip Ong. Aloha, you guys.